It seems like blacksmiths like things like railroad spikes, interesting twist patterns, and of course, cooking over the grill. So today I thought we would take a couple of railroad spikes, put a version of the Rubik's Cube twist in them, and then turn them into a pair of barbecue tools. Now I want to leave as much material as I can to draw out the shank end of these tools so that you get a decent sized spatula or steak flipper, but I also want to make sure that there's enough room for a comfortable handle. So I'm going to go ahead and lay out the width of my hand. This part then will become the handle, and this part will become the shank of the tool, and hopefully we can draw that out far enough. For this cube pattern to show on the corners, you need to chisel a line down the center of each face that's going to adjoin the corner with the cubes. Since I'm going to do this on opposite corners, I have to chisel all four faces that way. That'll make more sense when we actually start cutting the cubes out. You could do this with an abrasive blade on an angle grinder or a die grinder, but you can also do it at the anvil with a chisel. And I'm going to start by laying it out cold so I can get a nice line that I can follow again once I heat it up. Of course, the availability of a treadle hammer makes this job go a whole lot faster. While you want a nice deep line on these chisel cuts, you don't want them so deep that they meet in the middle and separate the corners away from the main bar. If you go that deep, you might as well turn it into a basket twist because you'll end up cutting all the way through when you cut the cubes. I am working in the induction forge today. If you hear something in the background, that's probably just the pump and the fan on the cooling unit. So now we need to cut in on those corners diagonally. Now what do you use to cut these with? A lot of people like to use an angle grinder. This is certainly going to be the fastest way to do it. And they do make some pretty thin cutting discs for angle grinders, so you're not going to cut too much material. A die grinder seems like a reasonable option, and I think I've seen pretty thin discs for these, but the ones I have are about twice the thickness as what I have in the angle grinder. So I'm not going to use the die grinder. I don't want to take out that much material. A hacksaw with a 24 tooth blade is actually the skinniest cutting option that I have. So that's what I'm going to use on one of these. On the other spike, I'm going to use the angle grinder with a cutting disc just to see if it makes any difference in the finished product. I certainly think the hacksaw does a cleaner, neater job of this. A little bit harder to steer, so you might need to practice some if you're worried about it being absolutely perfect. I'm not sure that that matters too much. The angle grinder is a really fast, really efficient way to do it, but it tends to leave a little bit of a rounded corner on the top, and I don't know if that's going to detract from the finished effect or not. We'll see. Now I think that half turn looks about right, but you can twist it as loose or as tight as you want to. That first one was the one with the hacksaw cuts, and the second one is the one with the angle grinder cuts. You want a nice even heat on something like this, and if you need to, spot heat with a torch or spot cool with some water. Torch is probably a little better.
If these need straightening, working over a wooden stump with a rawhide or wooden mallet will keep you from damaging the details that you've worked so hard to put in there. I'd like to take a moment and thank Ken's Custom Iron for sponsoring today's video. Some of the tools and the materials that I'm using for this project today were provided by Ken's Custom Iron several months ago. And back then we made this pair of railroad spike tongs from one of their tong blank kits. And they also provided the railroad spikes that we use for a railroad spike knife. But since I have extra spikes, that's what we're using for today's video. Their railroad spike bundle comes with the tong blanks, a twisting wrench sized just for railroad spikes, and three railroad spikes. I only have the two left, which is why we're making a two-piece tool set today. Ken's Custom Iron has so much more. They have tong blanks for just about every style of tongs you could possibly need in the shop. They make some H13 punches and chisels, which are a real nice addition to your shop, especially if you're just getting started and aren't ready to tackle hardening and tempering on your own. It's a great way to get some tools to start with. In addition, they also make a really nice air-supplied power hammer. If you're looking for a power hammer, that might just be the way to go. And there's a link down in the video description if you're interested in some products from Ken's Custom Iron. So now it's time to draw the rest of this out so that we have something that we can actually make our spatula and our steak flipper out of. I'm going to start by fullering in right at the edge of the twist pattern. It would be less likely to damage the twist if you did this first, but then it's going to make it harder to do the twist because you're going to have a skinny area right there and it's going to want to twist instead of twisting where you want it to twist. So I think this is the better procedure. You just have to be real careful not to mess up your twist pattern. I want to go down to about 3 eighths of an inch right here at the transition. And of course drawing out over the horn of the anvil is more efficient than drawing out over the face of the anvil. I've taken both of our tools down to about the same point, but as this gets thinner and thinner, the induction forge becomes less and less efficient. It's one of the things about the induction forge, the closer the coil fits, the better the heating efficiency. So at some point, it's time to go ahead and change coils. One real advantage to the induction forge though is that you can make your own coils relatively easily. For the spatula, I'm aiming for about a 3 8 square shank with maybe just the slightest bit of taper towards the end. Now for the blade on our spatula, I have no idea what this piece of sheet metal used to be, but I think it's going to work out just fine. I'll just sketch in what I want, cut that out of this, and then I'll clean it up at the grinder. How you cut this out is just up to what tools you have. We have looked at using cold chisels to cut stuff like this out. So if you have no power tools, nothing fancier than what you have right here at the anvil, a hammer and chisel will absolutely cut sheet metal, does an excellent job of it, just takes a little bit longer. If you've got a plasma cutter, feel free to use a plasma cutter on something like this. Angle grinder, whatever works for you in your shop with your tools. For me, I think I'm going to do this with a little porta band.
I'm just using little eighth inch rivets for this. I think we'll go ahead and go on to the steak flipper and I'll finish any shaping on this once that's done because I think I'm going to need to change coils in the induction forge again or I'll have to go to a torch. Either one would be acceptable. And on this I went ahead and drew it out to about the same point I had the other one but in the long run I would like these to be the same length. So this is going to have to get a lot longer, a lot skinnier, a lot more delicate. So I'm going to try real hard not to screw that up. I think I might also round it up because rounding will make it a little bit longer for the same base dimension. For the final heats on the spatula, I'm going to work in what's referred to as a taco coil. This one's a little large, it would be better if the coils were a little tighter and closer together. Finish these with a food safe finish of your choice. My preference is just plain beeswax. And then in use, just treat it like you would your favorite cast iron skillet. Mm -hmm.